Namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambuddhasa. In the last couple of installments of the series on early Buddhist history, I took the story up to the reign of King Asoka and the Third Council. And one of the uh, important initiatives of King Asoka was the sending of missionaries from India to neighboring countries in all directions, including the, the Greek world and uh, um, Bactria and, and South India and uh, Sawanabhumi, which is the Golden Land, which is what their name for Southeast Asia, Burma, Burma in particular, and most importantly for our purposes to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is of course an island, but it's actually a very short and uh, easy sea passage from India. So at no time in Sri Lankan history has it been isolated, it's always been in contact, sometimes unpleasant contact in terms of invasions with the Indian subcontinent. So it was already, one could say, within the Indian cultural sphere before the coming of Buddhism. The Sinhala people themselves, who are the dominant ethnic group in Sri Lanka, originated in India, probably in the Bengal region. And they recount in their own chronicles that the first Sinhalese landed on the island on the very day of the Buddhist Parinibbana. And the Buddha is said to have made, in the Sri Lankan story, the Buddha on his uh, deathbed was said to have made a prediction that the island of Lanka would become a stronghold of Buddhism, and he entrusted the care of protection of the island to Saka, king of the gods of Tawatinksa, and Saka delegated it to Vishnu, which is a curious detail because Vishnu is not one of the deities that occurs in the uh, older Pali sources. It became important in later Hindu belief. In any case, the Sinhalas were established in the island by the time of King Asoka and the missionaries. And the mission sent by King Asoka was headed by his own son, Mahinda, who had taken ordination and was a bhikkhu. And they converted the king of Sri Lanka at the time, Dewanampiya Tissa, who was already in friendly relations with King Asoka. And as we could expect from the chronicles of the time, the whole episode is full of miraculous events, including Saka sending to Sri Lanka the collarbone of the Lord Buddha that uh, had been kept in a, in a stupa in Tawatinksa heaven up to that date. This occurred in 247 BC by the best reckoning. And the next year, 246 BC, the uh, daughter of King Asoka, Sangamita, who was a bhikkhuni, arrived with a delegation of bhikkhunis to establish the bhikkhuni order on the island. And she took with her a cutting from the Bodhi tree. And this also is associated with miraculous events. When King Asoka wanted to send the uh, cutting from the Bodhi tree, he thought it would be sacrilegious to take a knife or a saw to the tree. And his advisor, Mogalaputta, Mogalatissaputta, told him, just put your hand on the branch you want to cut, and the tree will sever itself. And the tree severed itself, and the branch floated through the air and seeded itself into a pot that was waiting ready. Sangamita took this cutting to the island 
And it's said that on the voyage to Sri Lanka, the ship was attacked by Nagas who wanted to seize the, the Bodhi tree. So Sangamita used her supernormal power and turned herself into a supana, the giant birds, also called Garudas, that prey on Nagas. And she terrified the Nagas. But then they begged her for a chance to worship the Bodhi tree, and she relented out of compassion and delayed the voyage and let the Nagas take the tree to their kingdom for one week. So this episode of the coming of Buddhism to Sri Lanka was wrapped in these uh, mythical uh, episodes. It's part of the national heritage and part of the, the Buddhist heritage in Sri Lanka. And during the reign of this uh, first Buddhist king, Dewanam Piyatissa, the Mahavihara was established. And this is a very important institution in Buddhist history, in Theravadan history in particular. Every Theravadan bhikkhu alive today can trace his ordination lineage back to the Mahavihara, to this one monastery. This was the seat of Theravada. And as we recall from the episodes of the Third Council, at this time it was more properly called Vibhajavada. It was the, um, the group that was deemed orthodox by Ahsoka and the Third Council. And these were the ones who established the Mahavihara, which became the central monastery of Sri Lanka. And uh, over the years, other monasteries were established as branches of Mahavihara. So for some time, Buddhism flourished in the island, but the island of Sri Lanka had, in those centuries, had a troubled history with um, repeated episodes of invasions from South India and internal rebellions and disputed secessions to the kingship. From 205 to 161 BC, there was a period when the island was under foreign rule, when the Tamils from South India occupied the capital of uh, Anurudhapura and forced the king into exile in the south of the island which was always culturally a bit separate from the north. The king at the time was Dutagamani, and uh, he is remembered in Sri Lankan history as a, as a great uh, folk hero because he liberated the island from uh, the uh, South Indian rule. And it's said that he defeated the Tamil king in single combat. In the Mahavangsa, there's one episode recorded about Dutagamani that's kind of troubling. It's said that when uh, Dutagamani was nearing the end of his life, he uh, asked uh, one of his uh, bhikkhu advisors, do you think I've made terrible kama in my life with all the, the people I've killed in, in the wars against the, the Tamils? And this bhikkhu told him, uh, no, sire, you've made very little bad karma. You may have killed thousands and thousands of, of people, but only one of them had taken the refuges and precepts, and one more had taken the refuges without the precepts. So actually, you've only killed one and a half people. This is a troubling uh, a kind of a, a view to establish. It's basically saying that it's okay to kill non-Buddhists. Which, of course, is completely not in accord, completely at odds with the, the, the Buddhist teaching. In any case, Dutagamani did reestablish a united rule under the Buddhist Sinhala nation in, in Sri Lanka. 
The next important episode for Buddhist history occurred in the reign of uh, the king Watagamani, who reigned from 89 to 77 BC. And at that time, Watagamani founded the monastery of Abayagiri that would later become very important. The story is that there was yet another invasion from South India, and although the king was victorious in the end, he was defeated in one battle. And as his troops were fleeing from this site, there was a, um, a Jain monastery at the site, and one of the Jain monks mocked him as, he, as, as they were retreating and said, there goes the great uh, lion of Lanka running like a coward. And Watagamani said, if I get, if I'm victorious in this war, I'll have that monastery leveled and build a Buddhist monastery there. And that's what he did, and built a, a Bayagiri on that site. Immediately with the founding of a Bayagiri, there was trouble. There was a, um, a split or a schism with the Mahavihara monks. And this is uh, put to a bhikkhu called Mahatissa, who was a favorite of the king. And when the king established a Bayagiri monastery, he gave it personally to Mahatissa, which is contrary to the Vinaya, a, property, a monastic property should belong to the Sangha collectively, not to an individual monk. So the, um, the Mahavihara monks expelled Mahatissa, which in the, in the Sangha regulations means he was no longer welcome to sit in ceremonies with them. And this is a, an official or a ritual schism. So there was a separation already. And at this time, some of the Mahavihara monks decided that uh, conditions were so uncertain at that time with the various wars and rebellions that were going on. It was a very troubled reign. And with the uh, schism with, with the, um, the Baigiri monks, they were felt that there was a danger of the teachings being lost. So they held a council in the south of Sri Lanka, away from the capital, and rehearsed the, the whole Tipitaka while scribes wrote them down on palm leaves. And this was the first putting down of the Pali Canon into writing. It occurred at this time, and the decision was made to do so because of the fear that they would be lost, that the, the, the state of affairs on the island, which was the, the, supposed to be the stronghold of the, of the Theravada school, the conditions were so troubled that they were afraid that teachings would become lost. There wouldn't be enough monks that were educated, qualified to recite the Pitakas. This occurred about 89 BC, and it was the first writing down of the Tipitaka. By the 200s AD, the Abhayagiri Monastery, which from the beginning was always open to more eclectic and heterodox ideas, began to import Mahayana, the Mahavihara maintained a reputation and a tradition of being very orthodox and conservative and holding to the old teachings, whereas the Abhayagiri, their rival, was much more open to foreign influence and new teachers and new ideas. And by this time, too, uh, things were being written down so there would be an easier transmission of heterodox ideas because 
they could be transmitted by writing. In particular, the Abhayagiri adopted doctrines from what's called the Vatulia school, which uh, seems to have been an early version of Mahayana and held a number of doctrines about the transcendental nature of the Buddha that we discussed uh, earlier in the episode about the dissident schools. For example, that the Buddha never really existed in flesh and blood on earth, but remained into Sita heaven and just sent a, a, a nimitta, an illusion down to the earth to, to, to teach. So they were turning the Buddha into an eternal god rather than uh, an enlightened human. They also had some doctrines that approached the tantric position, in particular the idea that sexual relations could be a part of a spiritual practice. So from this time on, the early 200s, the Abhayagiri was moving more and more away from the mainstream or the orthodox position of the Mahavihara. The separation became greater. By the end of the 3rd century AD, we have the reign of King Mahasena. And uh, a number of important events occurred during his reign tooth relic was sent to Sri Lanka from India. The kingdom that held the tooth relic before was in disarray and they wanted to safeguard the, the tooth relic, so they decided to send it to uh, Sri Lanka. And that's, of course, become a very important national symbol. And the consecration of all the new kings always was done after that date in the presence of the tooth relic. And even to this day, when a new government is sworn in in Sri Lanka, even though the kingship has long since expired, when a new government is installed, they always make a pilgrimage to the, the tooth relic. Also, we have uh, the arrival of a monk from South India called uh, Sangamitta. As a similarity to the name uh, of... Um, the founder of the Bhikkhuni order in Sri Lanka, Sangamita, but the, um, that's entirely coincidental. They're not to be confused. This is a man, and the, the spelling in the Pali has a short A at the end, indicating a masculine noun. Uh, Sangamita became a favorite of the king, Mahasena, and uh, he was very definitely a Mahayana, and he convinced the king to suppress the Mahavihara. So for nine years, the Mahavihara was shut down, and the monks were scattered and exiled, mostly to the south, which was always kind of, the south of Sri Lanka was always kind of a um, semi-autonomous region, not totally under the control of the central monarchy. So often dissidents would go and hide out in the south. So the Mahavihara was out of favor, and the buildings were torn down, and the uh, precious objects and building materials were sent to Abhayagiri to adorn their, their facilities. So at this time, we can see that the Theravada lineage had come to a low ebb. It was out of favor, it had lost its seat, and the monks were scattered. But after nine years, there was something of a rebellion by some of the nobles against the king's policies, and a large part of that was his religious policies. And the king relented and allowed the Mahavihara monks to return and rebuild the monastery. But in the meantime, during those nine years, 
another monastery that was a branch of Abayagiri called the Jatawana Monastery had been established on the site, and now those monks were moved off, and they established another monastery called Jatawana that became a third. And they were schismatic against, the, against both the other schools. They established a third, a smaller, less important, but a, a third uh, tradition in Sri Lanka. So both of these monasteries, or monastic traditions, because most of them, or if not most, uh, probably all of the monasteries in Sri Lanka were uh, adherents of either Abhayagiri or um, Mahavihara. Uh, we had these, uh, these three traditions in uh, establishing Sri Lanka rivals. Then the next important event in the Theravadan history is the arrival of Buddhaghosa in the early 400s. Buddhaghosa was a very important figure in Theravadan history. He was a great scholar from northern India, and it's said that uh, he converted. He was a, a, a Vedic Brahmin and had the great knowledge of the Vedas. And then he converted to Buddhism, and he went searching for the commentaries. There were supposed to have been commentaries put down by the followers of the Buddha in the period after the Buddha's Parinibbana that were now incomplete or lost. And he searched and searched for a, a complete set of the commentaries. And finally, he was advised to try Sri Lanka, and he went to the Mahavihara in Sri Lanka, and they had they did not have the original Pali commentaries anymore, but they had Sinhalese translations. So he offered to undertake the project of translating the Sinhalese commentaries back into Pali. And the story is that as a test of his abilities and orthodoxy, the uh, Mahavihara monks, the elders there, gave him a test, you write a summary of the Buddha's teaching and we'll examine it and see if you, you know what you're on about. And so he wrote the Vasudhimaga, which is the, a very important text in Theravada tradition. It's kind of the summary in all Theravada countries. It's a, it's a very highly respected text. The English translation is The Path of Purification. And the story is that after he'd written this, and it's a, it's a very big book, it's like uh, 800 pages or so in the English version. And after he'd written this, this massive tome, mischievous Dewas hid the, hid the manuscript. And so the day he was supposed to present it to the Council of Elders, he had nothing to present. So they told him to you know, go back and do it again. And he rewrote the whole thing from scratch. And then the day was produced the original, and they compared them, and they agreed syllable for syllable. Or so the story goes. In any case, he passed the test. He was verified by the elders and translated the commentaries back into Pali. And these are the commentaries we have today, very important texts, that, uh, called Atakata. And uh, there are some additional ones written by uh, Dhammapala a little later, but the bulk of the commentaries were written by Buddhaghosa. And they are very important for establishing the orthodox position within Theravada and very useful for translators because often if there's obscure or cryptic passages in the, uh, in the suttas or, or the vinaya, the commentary will elucidate them, clarify them. Now we'll uh, jump forward several centuries to a few more important events. In the years uh, 1164 to 65 AD, there was a king, Parakamabahu, who reunited the Sangha under the Mahavihara. This was following another period of um, disunity 
and turmoil in the island, which actually had quite a troubled history in terms of uh, internal rebellions and secessions and external invasions. Throughout this entire uh, history, we, we see these sorts of things again and again. But King Parakamabahu was one of these great monarchs who managed to reestablish order. And he felt that the uh, part of the disunity in the island was having these dissident religious groups. And he, wanted, he favored the Orthodox Theravada line. And he had the, um, all the monks either, they had, all the other monks had to either agree to uh, return to the status of a novice and start again in the Mahavihara tradition or disrobe altogether. So he suppressed the uh, Bayagiri and Jatawana traditions. And from then on, all the Buddhist monasteries in Sri Lanka were under the aegis of the Mahavihara, or the Orthodox Theravada. Another important detail that occurred in relation to this um, council that Parakama Bahu held to uh, purify the Sangha was that a Burmese monk who had come to, uh, was learned in the scriptures and, and was invited to come and assist with the work of the council. When he returned back to Burma, he established a, a lineage of his own, which is called the Sinhalese tradition, so imported from Sri Lanka. And that became one of the the uh, ordination lineages, important ordination lineages in Burma, and was later exported to Thailand. It's around this time, too, that the Bakuni order died out in Sri Lanka, either just before or during the reign of uh, Parikama Bahu. The Bakuni lineage had dwindled so far that they could no longer assemble enough bhikkhunis to do further ordinations. And when the old, the last few remnants of the bhikkhuni order died out, then there were no more bhikkhunis. Then going forward again in time, the um, Buddhist tradition in Sri Lanka reached another crisis point in the uh, late 16th century when there was a king that favored Shaivism, you know, the worship of the Hindu god Shiva, and he actively persecuted the Buddhists and suppressed the Buddhist monasteries. And although his reign was brief and he, wasn't, he didn't completely destroy Buddhism, that combined with um, the problems of uh, the European colonial powers that were now becoming aggressive, particularly Portugal in this phase, the uh, Buddhist Sangha reached another low point, and the bhikkhu order within Sri Lanka actually died out. And there was, we don't exactly know when the last bhikkhus were ordained in Sri Lanka, but by 1750, there were no proper bhikkhus in Sri Lanka. And part of the problem seems to have been some internal corruption of the Sangha becoming a bit too wealthy and holding land, being, becoming landholders and you know, having uh, tenant farmers. So the monastic properties were now administered by laymen who wore white robes and took eight precepts, and they were called uh, Gananansi were the substitutes for the monks because they could not do any proper ordinations anymore. But then um, in 1753, the bhikkhu order was re-established in Sri Lanka from Thailand, or Siam as it was called. And the monks who were sent to re-establish the tradition in Sri Lanka were monks of that uh, Sinhalese lineage that dated back to the reign of King Barakamabahu and that Burmese monk. So the circle was closed. So 
So the lineage did not die out in the wider world, but it had died out in Sri Lanka temporarily and was reestablished from Siam. And after that, of course, Sri Lanka, from that date on to the present, had become, become a bulwark and a great center of uh, Theravada tradition. So, so what we can take from this history, which is um, uh, fairly abbreviated, I think I've covered the major points related to the survival and, and the propagation of the Theravada. But what we can take from this, this history is the precarious thread by which Theravada came down to us today. It only really survived by a very narrow margin in more than one instance. And when we take the, the broader history going back to the beginning of this series, what I've been really trying to establish is the, the actual historical provenance of the Theravada school. It's sometimes claimed by adherents of Theravada that our school is the original unblemished teaching of the Buddha. And this is in fact the position taken by the Mahawangsa that uh, it's a direct, unbroken continuation from the original teaching. And that's not entirely false, but it's a, it's a bit simplistic. It's a bit of a simplified view. What we see from the very beginning was that this particular branch, beginning with the Staviravada, after the Second Council, this particular branch always held it as an important central idea or an ethic of their school to try and maintain the Buddha's teaching in its original form. So it's always been a very conservative school, not open to radical innovations in either doctrine or practice. Um, and this uh, continued with the Third Council and the split between the Sarvastivadins and the Vibhajavadins. And the Vibhajavadins were those who held to the idea that past, present, and future can be distinguished. The Sarvastivadins are not that radically different otherwise from the Theravada. And if they still survive today, they would probably be able to argue a, a claim to preserving the original teachings as well. But as it happened historically, the Vibhajavada became established in Sri Lanka. And in particularly in this Mahavihara monastery. And some of the historical writing uh, uh, refers to that school from this period on as not yet even using Theravada, but calling it the uh, Mahaviharavadins. Because the uh, Abhayagiri monks also originated from that same root, from the monks who landed with Mahinda, although they split off from it. The Mahavihara became the, the center of Theravada teaching and orthodoxy, and this is where Buddhaghosa worked, who played a very important role in establishing and uh, clarifying, defining the position of Theravada. And, that, uh, and his, his work is held in all Theravada countries in great esteem. But even so, the bhikkhu lineage actually died out for a while in Sri Lanka. And there was a, a period of a century or more when there were no monks in Sri Lanka. And they were reintroduced from Siam from a lineage that originated with the Mahavihara. So the circle was closed. 
and the lineage was unbroken. So this, this uh, series as a whole, up to this point, uh, the intention has been to clarify and put into historical context the Theravada tradition and how it came to be and how it came to be established. And if we have an opportunity to continue this series in the future, I'd like to take it on into um, uh, the further spread of uh, Theravada into uh, Savanna Bhumi or Southeast Asia. So thank you all for listening and that will conclude. <laughs>